really appreciate uh, you having me here. So I wanted to talk about a few different topics today, um, all sort of things that I'm thinking about at the moment and things that I'm working on. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about JavaScript testing. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, JavaScript performance analysis, and then wrap up uh, talking about some of the cool things that we're working on uh, for the next version of jQuery that's going to be out here in about a month. Uh, if you have any questions while I'm going, please raise your hand. Um, usually, if you have a question, someone else probably does as well. Uh, it'll just be easier that way. Yes? Sure. So uh, jQuery is a JavaScript library. It provides a variety of functionality. Um, it provides uh, DOM selection, traversal, uh, manipulation, um, AJAX, uh, events, uh, things of that nature. It in, tries to make your life a lot saner, uh, not having to deal with uh, cross-browser issues and just generally simplify things. So I want to talk a little bit today about the importance of JavaScript testing. Um, I find that JavaScript testing is fundamentally um, very challenging, uh, much more so than uh, application desktop testing. Um, and it's, it's extra important because not only do you get the ability, the, the improved uh, sort of uh, development workflow, but you also get protection against regressions um, and, and against weird browser issues. So I just I want to really emphasize that you know, JavaScript testing is just fundamentally very different from normal application testing. I believe because you're just not dealing with vast quantities of weird browser uh, quirks across everywhere. So the question that I usually hear, uh, at least when people are getting started with JavaScript testing, is you know, they're wondering what to use to do testing. Um, I ran a survey a couple months ago uh, asking people what they used. And I got about 1,800 responses. And a lot of the responses were very, uh, we only got like one, one, one person said that they were using it. Um, so there was an incredibly long tail of testing frameworks. Um, there's, uh, and the reason why this is is that it's actually really, really easy to write a testing framework. So I wanted to kind of step through and show you how a JavaScript testing framework is constructed um, and uh, why you might consider building your own. So uh, a, a, test, a, a typical testing framework has these sort of components. Uh, you know, it has, you have the, the full suite. A suite encompasses a bunch of tests. Uh, one aspect that is usually pretty um, unique to JavaScript testing is testing asynchronous tests. Um, this is, you know, so you can test like uh, AJAX, uh, test animations, uh, things of that nature. Um, so at least uh, in that respect, that, that's very JavaScript, uh, JavaScript specific. But in general, JavaScript testing doesn't differ that much uh, from uh, the, the fundamentals of the framework doesn't differ that much uh, from other testing you might do. This as an example here, this is uh, sort of the, the absolute minimum JavaScript testing framework. Um, it's a simple assertion function, um, and all it does is it checks to see if the value is, uh, uh, that's passed in is true or false-ish. And if so, it logs out a statement that is either you know, red or green, depending off on if it's you know, passing or failing. So this is like the bare minimum uh, that you need to do testing. But at the same time, it's actually, uh, it, it, this is all that most testing frameworks are. They're, they're glorified you know, assertion logging frameworks. And they, you know, they're designed to help make it easier for you to log all this out so that you can read it later. Um, some of the structure that starts to come along then is, is more of the benefit for you as a developer to be able to understand these results that are coming through. So uh, usually one of the, the first uh, improvements that you see is uh, some sort of test grouping. So being able to uh, group a bunch of assertions together under a single unified test. Uh, and usually the test itself is linked to, let's say, a, a, a particular method in your API. So I mean, obviously it'll, it'll depend upon your application, how you choose to uh, uh, group your assertions. But in the end, though, it's really not that hard 
uh, to implement sort of test grouping. So this is uh, the full code. This is replacing the code from the, the previous slide. So again, we just have an assertion and we have a, a, a testing function. Uh, the testing function uh, takes in um, an additional function callback, and then that callback is, is executed every time um, the, uh, the test function is run. So I mean, it, 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 in the end, it doesn't make it that much more complicated, and all these assertions then are nicely categorized. Um, if we wanted to add in asynchronous testing, uh, then as I mentioned, as I alluded to before, that you know, asynchronous testing is a very um, JavaScript specific. Uh, it's, it's a sort of idiom that you see more in JavaScript than you see elsewhere. And uh, in these cases, um, for some reason, I'm testing uh, timeout, which you probably aren't going to do in your code since timeout is timeout. You don't really need to test it. And in reality, you would probably be testing you know, an AJAX request to a server and making sure that the correct response comes back or something of that nature. Um, but so you, so you see the difference here, though, is that there are two additional function calls. There is the uh, pause and the resume. So the pause, what the pause is doing is that it's, it's telling the, um, the framework to stop executing other tests. And then whenever the resume occurs, to, to again start executing the rest of the test, to continue moving along. Um, and the implementation for it is painfully simple. Um, so this is um, layered on top of the, the code from the previous slide. But all told, we, uh, this is a, a framework that has assertions, tests, uh, and asynchronous testing. And it's only about you know, 20, 30 lines of code. Um, so it's really not that hard to write your own testing framework. And I tend to encourage you to do it simply because writing a testing framework is a good way to better understand what you're trying to achieve when you're testing. Um, and at the same time, generally speaking, when you're writing a testing framework, there aren't that many cross-browser issues that you have to deal with. Um, it, you're just worrying about like, sort of logging out information. You aren't like, trying to develop something that's going to be completely, um, you know, it's going to have to worry about the different minutia of, of browsers. So in that way, it, I find it to be a, a good, healthy uh, JavaScript writing activity, at least. Um, but the reality is, is that people don't test. Uh, in the survey that I ran, uh, about half of the respondents uh, just didn't test their JavaScript at all. Um, and is, so this is just really unfortunate. So um, the reality is, is that you know, you, tonight you're probably not going to run back home and write a testing framework from scratch. Uh, you're going to want to use something that's already been built and that people are already you know, hopefully familiar with. Um, so in, in that way, there, there are a bunch of popular testing frameworks that already exist. There's, uh, and these are some sort of the, the top results. Uh, the big four uh, were uh, QUnit, JSUnit, Selenium, and YUI test. Uh, all those uh, had a, a significant number of uh, responses, and um, they were all effectively pretty much tied uh, in the results. I wanted to talk about those four uh, today. Um, specifically, when you do um, most testing frameworks that you see sort of center around the notion of doing unit testing. And, that, and that's roughly the, uh, the structure that I outlined in the little sample framework. You have assertions, and you're grouping by, uh, into test groups, uh, et cetera. Um, and then again, the popular frameworks here are, just, are QUnit, JSUnit, and YUI tests. Um, JSUnit has been around for the longest. It came out in about 2001. And it ha doesn't really feel like it's been updated since 2001. It's, it's a very crufty framework. Uh, and it's, it's really kind of frightening uh, if you start to look at the code. Um, it's a pretty much a straight, for, a straight port of the Java JUnit uh, stuff over to JavaScript. And it definitely feels like that. Um, just so, some sort of a sample code of like initializing tests and then running tests. But um, le like, like when I was checking out uh, JSUnit, I was trying to figure out how to get at the total number of tests that have been run. And this number was embedded in the page. And so I was using Firebug to try and go in and get at this number. And so I went in and inspected. I clicked the number. And, but when I did that, it was like nested so many layers deep. And, but the thing is, it wasn't, I, I was like, OK, it's probably in a table or something. It wasn't tables. It was all frames and frame sets. So like they, they, this is, I don't know why they didn't use tables. I would have loved tables. Uh, and they, there is this frame, frame, set, frame, frame. And it kept going down. It was 
yeah, so I mean, some people still use JS unit, but I highly encourage you to move to a more modern framework. Uh, there are very good ones out now. Um, so th this is the JS unit runner. Um, so YUI tests, uh, I tend to recommend YUI tests uh, very strongly uh, to people who are just getting started with testing. Um, it's, I'm not just saying that because I'm at Yahoo. I actually do uh, really like YUI tests. It's uh, very well written, um, has a lot of uh, great features, and, and uh, probably my favorite feature, though, is the really ex excellent uh, event simulation code that's in it. So you can use that to, to simulate uh, mouse clicks, you know, keyboard typing, things of that nature, so that you can, uh, you, can, you can layer that on top of your application to simulate all that happening. Um, what's sort of surprising is that, uh, what I found to be surprising is that it, uh, it rated so well, like so many people used it, and, but it's only been out for about a year at this point. Um, so uh, I was really impressed. I'm, I'm sure that uh, YUI tests are probably gonna be the most popular testing framework uh, probably by this time next year. So just sort of as an example, this is sort of what the YUI test uh, uh, code looks like. Um, you set up a, sort of these larger test cases which have sort of smaller test cases inside of them, and you can, you can set up and tear down uh, and do initialization and things like, of that nature. Um, YUI test has this little uh, runner widget that it's in, it, that's embedded in the page, and you see, and it logs all the results into. Uh, YUI test three, this syntactically is very similar to YUI test two. Uh, not that many major differences. Um, and the, the runner has been uh, spiffed up a little bit, has some gradients and some rounded corners now, so it's, 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 it's better. Um, uh, the QUnit, uh, this is a testing framework uh, that I helped write to, um, to do unit testing on the jQuery project. And uh, this is, uh, we've been working on it for a while now, and we're coming close to actually having a 1.0 uh, release. And this uh, uh, QUnit is structured very similarly to the example testing framework that I showed you before, um, incidentally, because that's how I like to do testing. Um, and uh, so it also supports you know, asynchronous uh, testing. And um, you can do test timeouts, so if you have stuff that's taking too long, you can, you can have a timeout and uh, uh, be marked as failed. Um, and, but I think more importantly is that it's, it's just really simple and really easy to use, um, much like jQuery itself. Um, just sort of an example of the kind of uh, syntax uh, you see when writing a test. Um, it, there's, there's these module groupings that you can cluster uh, multiple tests together and filter them out um, however you wish. And then just an example of the test runner. Actually, the test runner looks a lot better now. Um, just in the, in the past week, we got a bunch of contributions from some people at the BBC, and it, it, looks, it looks not like that. So, um, Fire Unit is... Um, uh, another unit testing framework that I wrote uh, that exists as a Firebug extension. Um, so the, this, if you're already using Firebug, this exists as a new panel within Firebug, and it exposes uh, sort of th this Fire Unit um, namespace that you can hook into and use uh, the testing functions from. So all the results are then logged into this extra panel. It, it's a, it's just, uh, an alternative to doing testing within a web page. Uh, some people like it. Um, what, what I think is pretty interesting, though, is that there's actually starting to, uh, there, there, there's some standardization starting to happen within the sphere of, of, unit te of JavaScript testing. Um, there's uh, uh, the Common JS initiative uh, has been working to standardize JavaScript on the server side. Uh, incidentally, they've kind of grown in that original scope, and they're now sort of you know, encompassing both the server side and the client side now. And so one aspect of that is that they've been working on sort of developing a sort of standard uh, testing framework format uh, for JavaScript. Um, so they actually just, they, they've, they've standardized the names of the methods so that um, you can use them across, well, theoretically, you'd be able to use the same testing method names across all frameworks. Uh, QUnit recently adopted this, and I hope uh, the other frameworks will too. Um, an interesting thing that uh, I, I see people using is doing uh, server-side testing. So this is doing uh, testing of JavaScript that is disconnected from an actual browser. So this is simulating 
uh, JavaScript, uh, so simulating a browser and doing testing within it. Um, I usually, I'll throw, I'm gonna throw a, a major caveat here because the problem is, is that whenever you do simulation, whenever you attempt to simulate an actual browser uh, or, or simulate what a user might be doing, at best, that's what it's going to be. At best, you're going to get a, an approximation of what is, the user is actually going to be doing. Nothing beats actually having a real user do real testing, and, um, and especially in a real browser. So it's, um, I just wanna throw that out there because um, I know some people do do server-side testing, but I don't, at least I don't know of anyone that does it exclusively so. They usually do it in conjunction with their normal testing uh, routine. Um, so f a few frameworks uh, that are uh, uh, pretty popular. Uh, Crosscheck, uh, another one I didn't mention, but another one that's good is uh, HTML unit. Um, those are both written in Java, and they're uh, full, uh, they, they essentially wrote the, the entire DOM in Java and, and running on top of Rhino. So you can run all this on the server side. Uh, is, is really quite cool. EMVAJS is a project that I wrote, uh, started a couple years back and since grown and uh, become its own, uh, own beast. And it's, um, it's, it's similar to cross-check in them in that it, it provides a full DOM uh, on the server side, but it's written in pure JavaScript. So it, it's, it's all in JavaScript and ideally it would be, be able to, to run on multiple platforms, not just in Java and in Rhino. Uh, Blue Ridge is a, is a more recent one and this one takes EMVJS and a couple other frameworks and creates a full uh, testing pipeline. Just to sort of give an example, this is an example of um, ENVJS running. So this, uh, this is actually in a console here. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with Rhino, but Rhino is, is an is a implementation of JavaScript written in Java. So it, it, you uh, have this, you usually just use it from a jar file, you know, you load up the jar file, and then you can uh, actually start running JavaScript right there in the console with no browser. There's no browser involved anywhere here. Um, and so in here we you know, load ENVJS and start running um, some various pieces of, uh, of jQuery manipulation. So the, the, test, the test suite of ENVJS is actually uh, the jQuery test suite. Um, and, and ENVJS is actually able to load a, a number of the major frameworks uh, and run them successfully. Another problem uh, that pops up usually when you're doing JavaScript testing is that since you're running against, you're, you're gonna be testing in multiple browsers and you're gonna want to automate that process um, because you don't wanna have to phys physically sit there, you know, open up a new browser, open up a new tab or click refresh and run the test again. You want all that to be taken care of uh, for you. And so th that's where this whole sort of collection of tools come in. There are a bunch of browser drivers that exist that uh, effectively, what they'll do is they'll sit uh, and act as a, a server and spawn browsers that run your test suite. So when they, when they spawn the browser, they'll try and collect the results and bring them back into your central testing area, wherever that may be. There's some very good ones out there, um, and I, I definitely recommend it, if, especially uh, if you want to automate that process. Uh, I should mention that uh, Selenium uh, does a very good job here. Selenium has a pretty, uh, a, a, almost a complete pipeline of uh, all the way from having a testing framework up to automation and then uh, d uh, including distribution. Uh, and just, just a little diagram from the Selenium site showing is, uh, roughly how it works, uh, how browser launching works. Um, you have this uh, uh, usually server, usually written in Java, sitting on your desktop and sitting there spawning browsers, uh, popping them up and collecting the results back out. Um, the problem then becomes, like, what if you want to write, you know, what, what if you want to like, integrate uh, this testing into sort of your continuous integration? You know, you want to make sure that on every single commit that you're, you're running against all these various browsers. Well, this becomes a really challenging problem. And it, it, it's also a problem that doesn't scale very well. So you can see here, that, so there, there's actually two different tools that are designed to, ex, explicitly designed to tackle this problem. One is Selenium Grid, where you can take your uh, Selenium tests and push them out to uh, Amazon and, and across their many, many servers. 
and, um, and run your tests very quickly. So th this is actually uh, very cool. Uh, it's, um, and, uh, it, it, and again, this is part of that full pipeline that Selenium has. It's quite neat. Uh, another tool that I've been working on is called Test Swarm. Uh, it, it works, uh, it's a little bit backwards. It works more uh, uh, where, where users are signing up and, and electing to help uh, participate rather than it being forcefully distributed out. Um, to talk a little bit more about that. So the Test Swarm um, came about because uh, in the jQuery project, we were having significant problems uh, scaling out our, our testing, our day-to-day -day testing. Uh, we were running against, like, it, we needed to be running against about 15 different browsers. Um, and not only that, but we had a number of different test suites that we needed to run in every single browser. And it just did not scale well. I mean, like, us sitting there opening up tabs or even trying to automate it with a browser launcher, it was just, it was just way too cumbersome. Um, and in the end, we wanted a way uh, such that the full community could help uh, help us test. Um, so this is sort of where Test Swarm came in. It, it works sort of like sort of like SETI at home, or another one of the, or another distributed project of that nature, where there's the central server that collects all these test suites, and then uh, clients connect and they help run tests just in their browser. It's constructed very simply. It's actually the client is just a. a, a a basic HTML page, doing AJAX requests, asking if there's any new tests at the server. And if so, it opens up a little iframe with the test suite in it, collects the results, and sends them back to the server. And it, it, works, it works quite well. Uh, just, just a sort of sh a rough diagram showing you how a, how a test swarm is built out. Um, the test suites are submitted by various projects. Um, as it stands, the, the test swarm service is, is exclusive to uh, a couple open source projects, um, but the software is completely open source. So if you wish to run Test Swarm on your own organization, you can just download it and run it yourself. Um, so all these tests get distributed out to everyone that's connected. The results get collected and displayed. Um, so this is a, the, sort of the, the home screen, uh, if you will. Uh, it's showing that the different clients that are currently connected to the Swarm. And this is sort of the the ultimate result of Test Swarm. What you have, you have uh, horizontally here, you have all the various browsers that are being tested against, and vertically you have the commits that are coming in. So you can, you can see exactly commit by commit what was changing in every browser. So you can see that you know, there, was, uh, there were errors happening in, uh, in Opera up until commit number 6432 in which case it switched green because obviously a fix for that was landed. So this, this provides, Test Swarm aims to provide a full, you know, the, the full continuous integration experience so that you can just submit your test suites in and everything else is taken, for, uh, taken care of for you. Um, you can sort of see, this is what it looks like when a suite is running. Uh, this is running the prototype uh, test suite. This suite is broken down into sub, its individual sub-suites. Um, and you can see the browsers running through, uh, running the tests live. So yeah, so this is, um, this is something that uh, I've been working on and we're gonna, hopefully gonna have the final release here uh, in the upcoming months. Um, but yeah, if you, if you uh, would like to help, uh, definitely go check it out. Um, it's down at the moment because I'm switching servers, but it'll be back up very soon. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're working on doing is hopefully being able to provide some incentives so that if you're helping and you are brave enough to be running you know, IE6 on like Windows 2003, then uh, you know, we will shower you with t-shirts and things of that nature. Um, the, there was a high scoreboard on the website that was very competitive. People were really gunning for it. And it, there was a lot of data there, so I had to t disable it. But that's definitely going to be coming back. <clears throat> so before I talk about uh, measuring JavaScript performance, um, uh, any questions about uh, JavaScript testing? So the question was, is Test Swarm coupled to any particular library or anything? Uh, no, it's not. So uh, Test Swarm has built-in hooks for QUnit, Selenium, Dojo, um, Prototypes Test Suite, uh, I think YUI tests, 
and a couple screw unit, a couple other ones. Um, so most of the major ones are in there. Um, and the, but the API for it is very simple. It's just you need to call like two methods, like you know, result came in and then all done. Essentially, there's like two methods. So yeah, so it, it, you can snap in. Like I showed prototype running, uh, prototype. I've gotten the prototype framework running, MooTools, jQuery, Dojo. All I've gotten them all running in the in the swarm. Yep. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, measuring, uh, f finding ways to accurately measure JavaScript performance. And this turns out to be a very tricky problem um, in, in which there's, uh, there's, a, there's both a lot of confusion and a, lo a lot of wrong results all around. Um, there are two sort of major use cases you see when it comes to measuring JavaScript performance. There's the case of where you have the same identical code, but you want to compare different platforms. Usually, the people that care about this sort of thing are the browser vendors. You know, the, the, the browsers want to know, you know, given this piece of JavaScript, you know, who, you know, which browser runs this code the best? Which browser runs this the fastest? Um, that is one distinct use case. The other use case is when you have different pieces of code and you want to compare the relative performance. Uh, so like um, you know, different JavaScript frameworks, and you want to see which one does you know, CSS selectors the fastest or something of that nature. Um, to start, I wanted to talk about the, uh, when you have the same code but on different platforms, so what, you know, uh, uh, analyzing different uh, JavaScript engines. There already exist a few frameworks uh, out there for analyzing performance. And I actually, I just before getting up on stage, I got an email from Microsoft, and it sounds like they might have just released one. So we'll, we'll see. There might be a fourth one here in a, in a little bit. Um, so these different frameworks um, give, you, uh, uh, give you different approximations for the relative performance of JavaScript engines. Uh, SunSpider was developed by the WebKit team. Uh, the V8 benchmark was developed by the V8 team. And Dromeo was developed, uh, I developed it uh, in my work at Mozilla. They all try to provide a certain level of um, statistical assurance that the results that you're getting are correct. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because it's, it's, it's really important, and especially being able to reproduce the results every single time. So SunSpider, um, in the SunSpider, when, when it was first released, all the results were very finely tuned and uh, designed to be uh, uh, very balanced. So all the tests would run, I think what they, I'm trying to remember, I think they took Firefox 2 and made sure all the tests ran in about the same amount of time on Firefox 2. Obviously, that's changed pretty drastically since then. Browsers have gotten much, much faster, so the tests don't run in the same time anymore. Um, they, also, uh, uh, they also provided some level of statistical assurance that the, the tests that were running were actually running within this amount of time. So that they, they could say that you know, this took you know, 1,000 milliseconds to run, plus or minus 5 milliseconds. Um, all the tests are run by loading a, a full test into an iframe and then loading that, you know, about five, five different times and doing the analysis upon those five results. Um, well, one problem, though, is that if, if you ever try to fix a bug in the test suite, uh, there's no versioning built in. So they kind of have to, like, throw the whole thing away and release a whole new suite uh, as the next version. Um, so when I'm talking about error rate, I wanted to kind of uh, explain that a little bit because it ends up being very important. It, it's, a, it's a way of, of saying how confident you are that the result that you're producing is actually what you say it is um, and that it's going to be within this certain realm of numbers and that, it, it, that the next time you run, the, run this test, you'll be getting something within that range. And this is uh, this is gonna uh, this is all going back to sort of uh, uh, the you know the normal distribution. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be throwing down a little bit of math here, but I think uh, we can all handle that. Uh, so the normal distribution, um, you know, it, it, the way it sort of works is that all the results, the majority of the results, are gonna be happening. You know, you know, the eighty percent of the time uh, is, is gonna happen right in the center. And but then you you'll have weird fluctuations that happen. You know, sometimes it'll run a little bit faster, sometimes it'll run a little bit slower. And you can see this in actual results. So this is some, uh, this is some test data from um, some runs that I did in different browsers. 
And you can see almost exactly these normal distributions here. You know, you can see, you, you, like blue is one browser, yellow is a different browser, red is another browser. And you can see this, you know, this tapering. The vast majority of the results are all happening around a specific time. And then you get, you get tapers off to each side. So what we want to be able to do then is, in, in, these, in these results, we want to be able to say that this middle result, you know, this is happening the majority of the time. And then, you know, the rest of the time, the less frequently it's going to be happening, either a little bit faster or a little bit slower. Um, to be able to determine a level of confidence, um, it's, uh, what you, you, you can use, there's different techniques, and one of them is called a, a, it's called a t-distribution. And it's a way of being able to say that the majority of the results are going to be happening within, uh, you know, within this portion of uh, this distribution. So you, in this case, um, around uh, uh, 80, sorry, around 90% of the results are going to be happening in this very small uh, portion of time. And then using this, you can end up with what's effectively called an error rate. So you can say that, uh, um, that you, you, can, you can promise that after, you know, that running this after, uh, you know, again, that you can promise with a 90% certainty or 95% certainty that you will get a number within this range. And you'll be able to use this. So you, you, then you can say, you know, you know, this took 123 milliseconds and then that, you know, plus or minus five milliseconds. So maybe next time it'll run a little bit faster, next time it'll maybe run a little bit slower. Um, so th that's, that's the technique that all these benchmarks use. And, uh, um, and I should say the, the Sun Spider one uses the T distribution and so does uh, uh, jQuery. Oh, sorry, sorry, so does uh, Jomeo. Uh, so the V8 benchmark, um, it works a little bit differently from the Sun Spider uh, benchmark uh, in that the Sun Spider one only runs the test five times, but the V8 benchmark runs it thousands of times. Uh, and the way it does this is that instead of trying to measure sort of the absolute time it took uh, to run a test, what it does is it tries to measure, measure how many runs per second you can do. Um, so you, you, uh, this is really nice because what happens is that tests that are really small and that tests that can run really quickly um, have a massive error rate. So like, like for example, if you have a test that runs really fast, only takes a millisecond to run, but then you know, you'd run it so it's like one millisecond, one millisecond, one millisecond, three milliseconds. If you think about it, that's, that's a huge error rate. Like you, you don't know what the res actual real result is going to be. It doesn't help that browsers have really poor timing mechanisms. Uh, so I mean, in, in general, the results are just very messy. Um, but I mean, if you look at a test that runs very slowly, um, you know, in this case, there, there's some fluctuation here uh, of you know, a four millisecond fluctuation, but since the numbers are so large, it doesn't really matter. So the, the problem is then is that the tests that run faster need to be run more times, because since it, when you start running on more times, you start to get more accurate results. And so sort of what you see then is that like if you uh, run, you know, like you can see here that like there's a slow running test. And there's a lot of fluctuation in the results of, a, of the slow running test, like at, an, at a, lot, a large absolute fluctuation, you know, maybe plus or minus 40 milliseconds. But since the results you're talking about are already like 1,000 milliseconds, that's, you know, it's just a very small percentage. Uh, whereas with a fast running test, that is not the case. And so what you end up with is that the faster a test runs, and, and, and consequently, the faster browsers become, the more error prone tests become. So especially tests like, like SunSpider. Uh, so the, the, because that means that because all, since all the browser vendors are actively trying to improve the performance of those tests, and they are, they're performing them very much, that means that the faster become, the, it, it, you know, the, more, uh, the higher that error level is going to, uh, to occur. So and this is where this really nice runs per second comes in that the V8 benchmark does. And, and, and this means that the... Uh, the, the tests that run the fastest just keep getting run more and more times. And what they do is they try to run it as many times as they can within one second. So at the very least, you aren't going to be running it for more than a second. It won't be freezing up your browser and everything. Um, so this is, uh, this V8 benchmark introduced this technique, and Dromeo uh, now uses it uh, um, as well. And so this is really nice because, uh, it, it, like I said, it, it's, it gives you much finer grained results uh, for the tests that need it the most. Um, so 
what, what you end up with is you end up with this runs per second number rather than a, you know, just an, an absolute number of seconds. Um, but what you, you can do is, is, is with that number, you can then run that whole collective test multiple times. So for example, what you, what you might end up doing is you might run, end up running it once uh, and it'll be, it'll, you, you'll end up with 1,000 runs in one second. And then you take the whole thing and run it again, and you end up with you know, many, many thousands of runs uh, to get at a single result. And this gives you just an incredible amount of accuracy in your data. Uh, and, and that's why I think this is uh, uh, so important. Uh, to get at a final result, you would probably use something like a harmonic mean, uh, just provided here as, as an example. And so you can end up with uh, a final number uh, that measure, accurately measures a, 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 you know, a runs per second. So Dromeo uses uh, both of those previous techniques. It, you know, it, it uses uh, uh, you know, error calculation and uh, a runs per second. And it's also uh, versioned so that you can, if, you're, if your tests are, uh, you know, if there's a bug in your test, you can go back and change it and it'll make sure that it doesn't try to run tests uh, against different versions uh, of, of, the same, uh, of the same test. So th uh, th this ends up being really important because tests do have bugs in them, and you do need to go back later and change them, which I just said. Um, so th but this all, all leads up uh, to the, the other problem area, which is uh, the problem of running different code on the same platform. Of, so this is, you know, the, the, the example I gave before was, you know, testing multiple libraries uh, uh, on the same, you know, doing, doing the same thing, but with different pieces of code. Um, the problem is here is that there are very few testing frameworks that exist to cover this sort of area. And the ones that do exist uh, are very poor. Uh, they just do not uh, work well, and they provide very inaccurate results. Um, one of the reasons for the, for the inaccurate results is sort of the problem of garbage collection that occurs in browsers. So uh, browsers are constantly churning and trying to free up as much memory as possible. They're going through and they're saying, okay, well, you're not using that object anymore. We can free that up. And you know, this gets expensive, especially you have many, many tabs open and, you know, and who knows, you know, there's flash going on, who knows. You know, th this, it can really add up. And so what you end up with are, the, are results like this. You'll, you'll see results, you know, 10 milliseconds, 13 milliseconds, 11 milliseconds, and then like 400 milliseconds. And like obviously your code didn't suddenly become slower like in the meantime. What happened is that the, the browser did a garbage collection in the background. Unfortunately, that's not something that you can control. It's sort of out of your hands. The browser's do off doing its thing. So you kind of have to take this into account when you're doing your tests. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously multiple techniques that you can use to try and arrive at a result. Uh, most uh, most uh, people that I've seen end up not using the mean, the, you know, the average, uh, and instead uh, start going towards uh, something like a mode. You know, you know, trying to figure out the most frequently reported result that comes out uh, uh, of all these numbers. But the thing is that you have to be really, really careful uh, about discarding bad results because inherently uh, numbers that are reported have some meaning. So uh, if, for example, if you ran um, a test with framework A that causes more garbage collections to occur, that in and of itself is probably important information. And, and the fact, and, and, and doing something like reporting a mode would actually discard that very important spikes uh, and, and make your results less relevant. So it's actually very important to not discard these garbage collections. So I mean, it's tricky because sometimes you just want to kind of uh, zero in on the actually important numbers, but the, re the reality is, is that you have to sort of encompass all of these. And, um, th and these spikes uh, as well also become more I should say, relevant. When you look at the issues with uh, uh, timer accuracy in JavaScript. So the problem is, is that uh, when you do get time in JavaScript, it's actually very, very imprecise. You would think, uh, well, when, when the numbers are reported, you see that they're all reported in, in, you know, in milliseconds. 
but the thing is that the timer doesn't update all the time. It updates actually very infrequently. So just to show an example, so this is a, a, some tests run on, a, on OS X. And these are the results that I showed before. And you can see that there's, there, there are really nice distributions of results. And, and the results are coming in uh, at every single millisecond. So the, the timers on OS X, the browser timers on OS X, are very, very precise. The precise at least down to the millisecond. But if we look at the results on Windows and on Windows XP, notice what we're missing here. You can see the results coming in, and they're coming in at intervals. There, there is absolutely nothing in between these 15 millisecond intervals. And that's because the timer is only updated every 15 milliseconds. So it doesn't matter how many times you run it in, in, in the interim or, or what accuracy you're trying to get at. Um, it's, it's only going to report at these specific times. And so, well, and if you notice, there are no nice little normal distributions anymore. Everything is clustered around single results. And this gives you really, really poor results. Um, if, if you ever see anyone try to give you a JavaScript performance numbers on Windows, you can just throw those results away because there, there's no possible way in which those numbers are going to be interesting or accurate. Um, and what's, what you're having here is that you're going to have an error rate that is so huge. You're going to have an error rate of up to 750%. I mean, so that, that's, you know, that's 7.5 times larger than the actual result. And that is just huge. Um, one interesting thing that I discovered when, when looking at this was that um, Internet Explorer running in Wine, uh, in the, this emu the, the emulation layer, actually has a really accurate timer. So if you run Internet Explorer in Wine on OS X, you can get access to an accurate millisecond level timer. Now, gr naturally, <laughs> you're then running Internet Explorer in Wine on OS X, and who knows how that browser actually performs in the, in the real world. Um, so, I mean, at least in this case, I, I found it to be interesting uh, to kind of casually look at, to sort of to try and get more accurate numbers, but definitely not used in any sort of real testing situation because that it's going to be pretty drastically different from the actual real Internet Explorer. Um, and just to show you here, you can see that the green numbers here, uh, that's Internet Explorer running in wine on OS X. So you, 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 there's no more you know, stark uh, uh, spikes like that. So the problem is, is that, you know, in the end, you know, how do we get at these good numbers? How do we get at uh, accurate timing information um, you know, in, in the browsers that we want to tackle? The, the reality is, is that we need to go and use the tools that the browser provides. Uh, or, or is, so you know, use, using the profiler that's baked into Firebug. You know, using the profiler that's in Safari, the profiler that's in Internet Explorer 8. And uh, all these are just are actually really good tools. Uh, they've they've improved dramatically over the past year or so, and they're really quite excellent. So usually the question that comes up now is, you know, how do I handle, you know, Internet Explorer six and seven? You know, the, the six and seven are still very real parts of our development workflows. And uh, one tool that I discovered recently, I've been very pleased with, is called Dynatrace Ajax. And it's a, it's a standalone tool that hooks into Internet Explorer, works with 6, 7, and 8, and it does full tracing of the entire browser. It's, it's really quite amazing. What you can see, you can see it even traces across network requests. So you can, um, like here, uh, this is actually on the, uh, I think it's on Yahoo, Yahoo Maps. And... Uh, so it's actually, you can, you can see it traces, uh, it traces through JavaScript, traces through the DOM, through the native browser DOM. So you can see exactly how long it takes to run native browser methods, like get element by ID, set timeout, stuff like that. So it traces through the timeout, traces through the AJAX, and you can see exactly how long it took to run each individual step and what ran uh, the other parts. I've been very, very impressed with this tool. And not only is it a great tool for Internet Explorer, it's just a great tool in general. And so like, I've already made this a, a, a part of my uh, testing uh, uh, toolkit. Uh, just to sort of zoom in here. Uh, so you can actually see, um, 
uh, uh, so, okay, so we have a detach event and set interval, and both of those are native browser methods in Internet Explorer. So you can actually see how long it took to run those browser methods themselves, which is something that no other testing tool provides. So I was very impressed with that. Another way to get at really detailed information is uh, doing shark profiling. So uh, shark is a, is a tool uh, that you can use to, to get at the underlying sort of internals of, of an application. It's not browser specific, uh, but I mean, it, it works for browsers. Um, so it's very, very low level. There's a, probably a good chance it won't be immediately useful to you, but if you find a weird bug and, uh, in a browser and you attach a shark profile to your bug when you submit it, I can guarantee that they'll be more likely to respond to you because that is exactly what they want to see. Um, so this, is, this can be really good for you if you're filing bugs. Uh, so you, you sort of get this full massive dump. It kind of looks like what you see from Dynatrace, but it's not like it at all. You have all these really cryptic names. So this is tracing through Firefox, through their, uh, through their JavaScript engine. And uh, unless you really know the JavaScript engine internals, it, it really doesn't make much sense. Um, so that's what I want to talk about, about analyzing performance. Any questions really quick before I talk about jQuery 1.4? Is there a way to force the browser to do garbage collection before you start your tests? Um, not that I know of. And it's, it's definitely not in a way that's cross-browser. Um, well, OK, well, one way to force it is to close your browser, open the browser again, and then, and then run your tests. I mean, that, that's the ultimate garbage collection. Um, um, and usually what you find is, is that if you're doing, so like, like uh, Mozilla, for example, when they're doing uh, performance analysis on, their, uh, on Firefox, for, so what they do is they have a whole server farm and um, constantly churning out builds and popping up new copies of Firefox. So what, what it'll, it'll do to do a performance analysis, it'll, pre, it'll pop up a fresh copy of Firefox. And this is very fresh and that just built. Um, and it'll run through the tests, close it completely, and then open it and start it again. And that, that is the only way you can really get at uh, um, sort of just absolutely stable numbers. So uh, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for really, really stable, and other, don't have stuff running on your computer as well. The other stuff can mess up everything. Um, like th there was one thing that I heard where if you run, um, I'm trying to remember what the exact, I think it's if you run iTunes, uh, on Windows uh, or QuickTime, I don't. It, the timers start to become more accurate uh, because, like, because, like, 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 you know, I think it was. Like, I, I don't remember the exact. Or maybe it was Windows Media Player. It was like something taps into the internals of Windows and, sa and says, tells Windows to start becoming more accurate, and then everything. It, it's it. Like I said, so just kill everything and start fresh, and at, at the very least, you can start to get at some decent numbers. What about the newer versions of Windows? Uh, same problem. Um, I, in fact, I, I think I did results in other browsers, or sorry, in, in other uh, versions of the operating system. So just, sorry, just to repeat, w w the question was, uh, what about in other versions of OS besides Windows XP? What about, you know, Vista or 7? I haven't tested in 7 yet. I don't have high hopes. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean that's a, it's a pretty low level thing. And I think if they change that, a lot of other stuff would be changed. One thing I should note, though, um, jumping back to those, uh, to those results, that's IE Opera Safari. That does not include Firefox and Chrome. Firefox and Chrome have accurate timers on Windows. Um, they do black magic to conjure up the correct times. I, I, I'm honestly not sure what they're doing, because they're obviously using a better API than what Internet Explorer is using. Um, and and uh, so yeah, I, I, I should just qualify by saying, in this situation, may have since changed. I, I'm I tested Safari three one there. Maybe that change from Chrome got backported, and maybe that's maybe it's now in Safari four. I'm not sure, um, but it's definitely not in IE eight. I'll tell you that. So I know that for certain. So I wanted to. Okay, so I wanted to talk about some of the interesting problems uh, that, I've been, that we've been working on lately uh, in uh, jQuery 1.4. Uh, 
Uh, so jQuery 1.4 is currently slated to, uh, we, we did the first alpha release last Friday, um, and the final release is currently slated to be released uh, mid-January. Um, so there are a few interesting problems, I feel, that we tackled in uh, 1.4. Uh, reducing the overall complexity of the code. I want to talk about how we did that. Um, adding in support for more bubbling events, uh, which that, that, that don't normally bubble in Internet Explorer. And then uh, doing uh, script loading. So to reduce complexity uh, in jQuery, um, one of the things that we started to do is to t kind of take a step back and to stop looking at absolute times. Because one of the problems that we, we found was that you know, we were spending too much time trying to compare ourselves relative to other frameworks or trying to compare our speed relative to old versions of jQuery. Um, when the reality is that we, uh, that we should be spending more time uh, sort of imp improving the overall code flow and code quality of jQuery itself. And through that, we can get performance improvements. So one of the ways we did that is, I, I mentioned this earlier, the, the Fire Unit uh, 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 testing framework that I built for, um, for Firebug. The, one of the things that I added on to Fire Unit was a way to programmatically get at the full data dump of a profile run in Firebug. So that you could use this data and you could, you could get a full you know, JSON data structure of all the data that came out in a profile. So you, you can use this and you could get at you know, the, exactly how much time in milliseconds uh, it took to run a specific uh, function. Um, you, and, but more importantly, you can get at the number of calls, the number of function calls that occurred. Because when you start getting at the number of function calls, you can start to compute a level of complexity with your code. So I use the term big O notation here. It's not real big O notation. It's sort of a, a one-off, as I call it. But what this means is, so like, like I, I, tested, I wanted to test the complexity of adding a class, for example. Um, so I ran add class against, it was about like 95 elements. I don't remember the exact number. It was about, it was about that many. And, and then I looked at how many function calls occurred. So what we could find was is that calling add class, for every single time you called add class, it would, it would call six different functions for each individual element. That's a lot of, that's a lot of function calls. You know, that, that can add up. Well, so while function calls in and of themselves don't necessarily indicate slowness, function calls may just indicate maybe, a lot of function calls may indicate a, just a poorly written piece of code. And, and that you, there may be ways of optimizing it further. But the, so the nice thing about this is that it's sort of removing the time portion of performance analysis away from the actual trying to improve your code. Um, so we can see there's various levels here, you know, the 6n, 9n, um, but we can see one really bad one here, remove. Um, that was 2n plus n squared. So that, that's a huge number of function calls uh, for, for every single element. Uh, so that, that was one that we improved, that we looked at right away, because obviously that's a, there's a problem going on there. Uh, so we looked at it in a, a little bit more, and we realized, at least in the case of remove, that it was trying to traverse through and call things more often than it needed to. So we made that improvement, and everything that used improve also, uh, sorry, everything that used remove also improved. So like HTML and empty, both of those also used uh, remove. And so we were able to drop uh, the time down uh, to about 3n from that mass of n squared. So just to, oops, oh, just to sort of show you, so these are some of the, the times that came up uh, this is in jQuery 1.3.2. So you can see a few n squareds. Um, the find div down there is 16n. Uh, there's quite a few up there. But watch what happens when we switch to the complexity of jQuery 1.4. Uh, that's, you know, so I'll flip back and forth. Things become way simpler. Um, so like all the, you know, all the n squareds are gone. The 16n is now a 5n. Uh, that a n is now a, oops, a zero n, <laughs> in that it, it, it only calls two functions total, uh, no matter how many elements you put in. 
So using this, we were, at, we were able to get some really excellent performance improvements. Um, yes? So um, Big O is a, a, so it's, it's a way of denoting complexity. So for example, um, uh, the way it's usually used to say, like if something is, has a, uh, a complexity of n, that means you, it, 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 it's, it's a linear complexity. And that like it, you, for every single time that you call, uh, how does explain this? And in, the, in the case of jQuery, for every function call, there's, sorry, for every element, there'll be one function call, okay? So for something that, is, that has a complexity of 3n, it would be, for every element, there would be three function calls. So it, it just, it's just sort of a way of denoting, uh, uh, so usually a bigger number, a more complex equation, uh, just the, the, more com the longer it takes to run, and usually the worse performance you're gonna get, so. Um, so the numbers, oops, is, it's kind of small, but you get, um, so we have jQuery 132, took about three seconds to run, uh, and jQuery 1.4 uh, uh, took less than a second to run. Uh, so we're, we're seeing improvements of about 3.5 times uh, over uh, the previous version of jQuery. And, th and so this is, and this is all without, take, you know, without looking at number, without looking at uh, performance absolute time numbers. We were strictly looking at comparing and improving ourselves. So you know, more of uh, reducing our overall complexity. Uh, any question real quick before I move on to event bubbling? No? Okay. So another problem that we tackled in 1.4 is uh, sort of the issue, uh, the, the, the number of issues that Internet Explorer has surrounding event bubbling. So in, one, three, in one, jQuery 1.3, we add the new uh, live method. And this live method allows you to, um, uh, it, it allows you to, to do event delegation really, really simply. So an, an event delegation just works by, you know, if, if an event occurs someplace on the page, the event bubbles back up, you capture it and you handle it. So you bind less event handlers and your code overall is generally much faster. Uh, the problem is though is that um, Internet Explorer uh, doesn't bubble some, some events. It doesn't bubble focus, blur, change, and submit. And so those are ones that we had to implement uh, uh, and override their lack of bubbling. So one, one of the tools that we used was this method uh, developed by Yuri. And it's, it's a way of determining if uh, an event will work on an element. So you can, you can use this method to figure out, like for example, we can say, you know, will a submit event ever happen on a div? Um, and that will return true in every browser but Internet Explorer. Because in every other browser but Internet Explorer, the submit event will bubble up. So we're able to use this information to determine, you know, will, you know, will this actually happen in, in, in the browser that we want? Incidentally, the easiest one to fix are, are the focus and blur events. In Internet Explorer, they provide some alternative, they have a whole bunch of uh, um, different focus and blur style events, one of which is focus in and focus out. So you can just replace, and both of those bubble. So you can just replace focus, sorry, you can just replace focus and blur with focus in and focus out, and it works wonderfully. I wish all of them were that easy, but it's not. Uh, submit is, is much trickier. To, in order to make the su submit work in Internet Explorer, what you have to do is um, you have to watch for the click event to occur. So if someone clicks the submit button or clicks an image submit button, um, then you can capture that. Additionally, if someone hits the enter key and an input, that will trigger someone that'll tr that'll trigger a click on the submit button. Which all this works great. So you can just watch the submit button. But the problem is that if you don't have a submit button on the page, or, or, or sorry, you don't have a submit button in the form, um, there's no way to get at the submit event uh, unless you attach uh, a key press handler. So if you attach key press, you can then figure out when someone's hitting enter in a text area or a password. So the, even that one wasn't quite so bad uh, when you compare it to the change event. The change event was, is a real, real bear. Um, 
so in order to do the change event properly, you essentially have to implement the full change event. You have to track, um, you have to track all changes that occur uh, to the input. You have to track its previous value, and then on Blur, check to see if it's changed in the interim. Uh, it's really quite convoluted. So, uh, you also have to track if someone's using the keyboard to navigate around the form. Uh, it's, a, it's a large, convoluted piece of code. Um, one interesting thing I thought that I thought that there was an event in Internet Explorer called Before Activate. And Before Activate um, is another one of those crazy special uh, Internet Explorer events. And in this case, Before Activate happens before a radio button is, is activated. Um, and you can use that to get at that value uh, before that occurs. Um, another new piece of functionality we've been working on, uh, just recently, I just, I just committed this to a branch um, the day before yesterday. It's uh, called jQuery require. And it's a way to uh, dynamically load uh, pieces of, of jQuery code. Um, so in setting out to do this, we wanted to build a, a, a script loader that would just work really, really well. And that uh, we felt you know, would, wouldn't harm applications and would actually benefit them. Um, so some of the things that we did that are just given are, are that we wanted to make sure we didn't load duplicate files. Uh, we wanted to make sure uh, that if you ran it, it would be run uh, um, uh, synchronously. And, and that uh, you know, if, you try, if you did a require, then try to use some code that used the require, it would be loaded ahead of time. Um, you just, just simple stuff like that that we wanted to make sure. But the important point is, is that we uh, made sure that it worked asynchronously. Now, what we mean by that is that uh, you can load multiple files, um, and those files will be loaded up in the background, and they'll be downloaded in parallel. Uh, so you can download multiple files in parallel and not block the browser execution. So this is so not only does it make it uh, um, faster in, in that you know your scripts will be downloading much faster, but it won't freeze the browser while the script is downloading. So this is really a win-win situation. It, it, the scripts will download faster, and it'll it won't prevent the user from doing anything. So the way it works is, we load all the scripts asynchronously uh, before uh, the, the document ready event occurs, and then we just delay the document ready event uh, until all the scripts are loaded. And it, it works. Uh, it really works quite well. Uh, I should mention that we also get that because of this, we guarantee uh, that the scripts will continue to, uh, to load in the correct order, even though that we're even though we're loading them asynchronously. Uh, we also provide some uh, URL, um, URL mapping, so that you can type a simple thing. You can say you know, jQuery require AJAX, and that'll map out to you know, AJAX.js. But you can also do some basic namespaces, and it'll translate them into uh, into full you know, file names. You can, you can you can also specify full namespaces. So if you have your code living in a specific directory off somewhere or on a, a specific server, you can specify that, that full namespace, and that'll get auto completed and filled out and, and, and when it requires. So I think that was the major content I wanted to cover today. Um, I have one little. Uh, bonus section uh, that I wanted to uh, discuss super quick. So uh, one interesting thing that I've been seeing recently is that there's a lot of people who really want to start using HTML5 today. Um, and a lot of people are trying to use the new HTML5 elements in Internet Explorer, especially in older versions of Internet Explorer. Um, and they're running into a lot of problems. So I, I just wanted to kind of outline the variety of problems that exist right now, because it's, it's a real minefield. Um, consider this a follow-up to my Dom is a mess talk earlier this year. Um, so one of the first problems, the first one that everyone encounters, is that they find that they can't actually style um, H, the HTML5 elements in Internet Explorer. It just, it's as if they just don't exist. Um, so what you have to do, uh, is someone found out a while back, that if, if all you do is do document create element, uh, an, you know, an element that Internet Explorer doesn't know about, like an HTML5 element, then suddenly you can start styling it. And this works, this works quite well, actually. Um, there's a nice little script that you can download that has a full list of all the HTML5 elements in it. it you, can just, you can stick it in your header. It's like 
300 bytes, it's, it's really tiny, and suddenly all your HTML5 elements can become styleable. So that's really cool. Um, however, uh, the problem then becomes that if you try to put an unknown element, so an, an HTML5 element, into an other one, an Internet Explorer, it just, it'll just kind of barf. It doesn't really know what to do. And it, the elements just, uh, you know, get pushed out of their container and get, kind of get strewn about. Um, unfortunately, there's really no good solution there, uh, short of dynamically constructing the DOM yourself. Um, but at least when you ship it in the page like this, it, it won't work um, right away. Another problem is that uh, Internet Explorer thinks that these HTML5 elements aren't actually HTML. Uh, it thinks that they're some sort of maybe XML. I don't know. It's kind of hard to figure out what Internet Explorer is thinking sometimes. Um, but it, like if you look and try to see what the no name is, the no name is actually case sensitive, uh, which is very different from HTML in which HTML, all the node names are case sensitive. Um, and so the sort of the solution here is that you kind of have to assume in your code that the, uh, the node name will never be all uppercase, which is kind of weird since it should always be. And then finally, uh, the other big problem is that if you try to inject um, uh, HTML5 elements using inner HTML, it'll just completely not know what's going on. Uh, you end up with elements that with like a no name of like slash section. Like it, create, it creates an element for the opening section and the closing section, two, ex, two different elements. It's, it's really bizarre. It's like it's just some of the crazy stuff you see. Um, and so this, the solution here, as I say, the solution is to write a full HTML parser and uh, to parse the HTML yourself and construct a DOM. So obviously that's uh, a pretty crazy solution. Um, that's something I'm going to do, but it, it, I don't. I don't recommend it. Um, the yeah. So and there's just some problems I wanted to outline that, that are happening right now. And if you try to use um, HTML5 elements in Internet Explorer, you're going to hit fun problems. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, are there any uh, any questions about anything I discussed or um, about jQuery or what have you? So the, the question was, you know, do do people when when I show them, you know, the list of, you know, th how H how the HTML5 elements are broken, do they see the reason and not use HTML5? Um, at least not yet. Um, I, I de I'm, I'm going to probably talk about this a little bit more, um, but it's 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 really an unfortunate situation right now. So I mean, you can use some elements some of the times um, as long as you don't try to put them inside of each other. And you don't try to dynamically create them, and so like I don't know, it's, it's um, I, I think I think the situation is probably a little bit more tenuous than people realize. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's just kind of tricky. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's really up to the author themselves <laughs> if if they decide to, to uh, derive benefit from it. So what's my opinion of, uh, of Chrome Frame um, as a solution to Internet Explorer, or just, OK? As, as, as a I mean, I, I guess that could work. I would just prefer that they just move to a different browser. Um, I, I mean, the, I think the reality of the matter is that um, I, I, I find it hard to see a situation in which someone would be able to and willing to install a plugin but in which they are not capable of upgrading their browser. It, does, it seems like mutually exclusive. Or like it seems like the people who have the same problem, they're going to have the same problem either way. Um, are you sure? Like, 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 are you sure the same situation where someone can install Flash themselves is also the same situation where they can uh, you know, not upgrade a browser? Usually when you're in that lockdown of a situation in a corporate environment, you can't upgrade a browser, you can't install a plugin, you can't do anything. Uh, I mean, you know, that you aren't you aren't the administrator of your machine. Um, so it's I think the fact of the matter is that you, um, uh, um, that I, th I think most most at least most of the companies I would imagine that would exist that would 
be capable of using Chrome Frame are also capable of upgrading their browser. Um, so uh, the, que uh, the question was, what, what's my confidence level in tools like Task Speed and Slick Speed? Um, Slick Speed is a framework developed by the Moo Tools uh, devs uh, that analyzes the performance of uh, CSS selectors in various frameworks. Task Speed is a framework developed by uh, Moo Tools and Dojo to analyze the performance of various tasks, like HTML injection, adding removing classes, binding events, stuff like that in various frameworks. They both use the same uh, basic framework, though, the Slick Speed framework. Um, so my opinion of them is not very high. Um, based upon the, what I said, they, they have no statistical assurance whatsoever. They run the tests about five times, um, which is very low. And especially for how long they take the run, it's very poor. Um, you'll find, at least in the, in, in the slick speed, for example, you'll find that the t most tests run in less than 16 milliseconds, which means that the timer granularity issue, like, like if, you, if you go and run slick speed in Internet Explorer, you'll look at the times, it'll be like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 16, 0, 0, 0, 0. And you're like, wow, I have the fastest browser ever. And it's not the fastest browser ever. Um, so it, you, it's, it's just really unfortunate. Um, there, there needs to exist better ways. And I've seen one version of Slick Speed that um, adds in where it starts to do runs per second. Um, but it, it, it only does that run per second once and then doesn't try to provide any sort of statistical bounds on it. Um, it's, it's really quite unfortunate. Uh, I hope better tools come along. Have I looked at Google Closure and what do I think of it? Uh, so there's two things. There's Google Closure, the library. Um, it's, it's all right. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I looked through it. I, there's, I didn't see anything that really blew me away. Um, uh, there's Google Closure, the compiler which is pretty slick. Um, so the Clojure compiler works sort of like uh, YUI min, uh, and Dean Edwards Packer, and various other compression scripts. Um, it has both a basic compilation mode and then an advanced compilation mode. Uh, the advanced mode goes much farther than other uh, toolkits or, or, or other, other frameworks. That being said, there's a huge asterisk around that, meaning that uh, if, you try, if you try to just go today and take jQuery or take YUI or take prototype, put it in on advanced mode and compress it, all you're going to do is get a broken piece of JavaScript out. Um, because the way that the Clojure compiler is designed is that you put in your framework, you put in your plugins, you put in your code, and then you compile all of that together into a single code base. And that one file you put up in your website. That's the way it's designed to work. Um, using it like you would YUI min is going to cause problems. And I don't think a lot of people realize that yet. Um, I, I, know, I know when I first used it, I popped in jQuery. I'm like, wow, it's so small. Well, it's so small because like half the code got ripped out in the meantime. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so you, you kind of have to be aware of that. And you have to um, realize the situation in which it was built. They built it so that they could put a single JavaScript file on their website, and that would have everything in it. And, and, and all the non-essentials would be stripped out. So um, yeah, I definitely uh, rec I, I recommend checking it out. It, it may be useful for your application, but just be aware what's going to happen.